The year is 1960, and America is losing the space race, the Cold War, and its own future. Because half of its high school graduates are functionally illiterate, and the classroom hasn't changed in a century. So educators and politicians are both desperate for a solution. So a frustrated physics professor proposes a radical idea to a young engineer named Donald Bitzer to use computers to personalize education for every student. But computers at this point are million-dollar room-sized calculators designed for missile launches, not teaching algebra to teenagers. Bitzer's response? To build what no one believes is possible. Plato, the world's first digital tutor. And it's more than just a computer because it's actually the foundation of modern education in the machine age. And with it begins the era of AI tutors, completely changing not only education, but what it means to learn in the era of machines. Personal computers are being welcomed in schools and in businesses and in homes. College students are reportedly turning to artificial intelligence for help with their coursework. Students are using AI to cheat on everything they're doing. What's even worse is that they're bragging about it. If you saw my video yesterday, you know I got called in at my professor's office for using AI, but today's a new professor and a new exam, so we're still gonna be ripping AI for the whole test. A Texas school is letting technology lead the way in the classroom. At the Alpha School in Austin, Texas, students are in the classroom for only two hours a day with an AI tutor. We can provide products to higher education that no one else provides. Someday, when the next Aristotle is alive, we can capture the underlying worldview of that Aristotle in a computer. Thomas Jefferson once said that any nation which expected to be ignorant and free hoped for what never was and never will be. The year is 1964, and by now, the programming logic for automatic teaching operations has completely changed the world. Because before this, computer screens basically didn't exist. But for the first time ever, students could actually see what they're learning. And not only that, Plato instantly revolutionized screens forever. But Plato was more than just a revolution of screens and displays. Because by 1972, the Plato 4 connected over a thousand different students simultaneously from terminals around the world. And within an instant, students were chatting, sharing notes, and helping each other with homework. And unknowingly, they were creating the first ever social network, a full 20 years before the internet technically existed. And what's even more funny is that they even accidentally invented computer emoticons, all because they needed a universal solution to the problem that was students continuously misunderstanding each other's messages. But that's not all because Plato also created a few more staples that we officially use today in our everyday lives. Things like touchscreens, forums, email, instant messaging, all for education. All wouldn't be possible without Plato. But then something unexpected happens. Parents and educators alike become concerned about too much screen time. Why? Well, because some students at the University of Illinois become so addicted to Plato's educational games that campus police have to enforce a 9 p.m. gaming curfew. Now, think about that. Could you imagine students becoming so engaged with learning that cops have to physically remove them from terminals at their parents' requests? And this newfound addiction to screen time creates a negative reaction to the idea of Plato in general. So parents and educators alike begin to sound the alarm on the dangers of students having too much unsupervised access to Plato. Sound familiar? But despite all of the negative press, Plato proves the impossible because it proves without a shadow of a doubt that students actually love to learn when it's personalized, interactive, and social. One system teaching thousands simultaneously, each at their own pace, with instant feedback. It was the holy grail of education. But there was just one problem. Plato runs on mainframes that cost millions and fill entire rooms. And each terminal costs more than a teacher's annual salary. So Plato worked brilliantly for the lucky few with access, but it couldn't scale 
So the technology that could completely save education was trapped in university computer labs. So solving the literacy crisis meant getting this power into every classroom. So the question becomes, how do you shrink a room size mainframe into something a school and maybe even a person can actually afford? So somewhere in Los Altos, California, in a random garage, two guys named Steve are about to accidentally answer that question. The year is 1977, and the Apple II launches at a whopping $1,300 price tag. But believe it or not, it's a computer that schools can actually afford, and schools around the world begin shopping for the best computers they can buy. And Minnesota's Educational Computing Consortium needs 500 computers for their schools, and Radio Shack wins the bid. Then they blow it off. Too much hassle, not enough profit. So Apple jumps through every hoop and eventually they win the contract. And with that single deal, Apple becomes the standard in American education. But Steve Jobs sees the opportunity because in 1982, he personally walked the halls of Congress for two weeks lobbying representatives for tax breaks, not sending lobbyists, Jobs himself buttonholing politicians about computers in classrooms. So eventually, California caves to his will and creates Kids Can't Wait, a program that lets Apple donate nearly 10,000 computers to schools for tax write-offs. So by 1983, there's an Apple II in almost every American school. And for the first time, regular kids, not just university students, are touching computers. So within days, students start playing Oregon Trail, a game that allows them to virtually die of dysentery on the frontier for fun, but completely hiding the fact that they're actually learning history. And some students are programming in Logo, teaching digital turtles to draw squares. But some teachers begin to panic. Some are concerned that computers may replace them, and some parents begin to worry about screen time. The same arguments we're having today, but just 40 years ago. So educators begin to realize that having computers in classrooms is one thing, but making them actually teach? Well, that's another. I mean, sure, the Apple II can run educational software, but it's still basically a digital worksheet. Type an answer, get some feedback, and move on. But despite being incredibly limited, the Apple II did single-handedly solve the hardware problem, because now computers are finally affordable and they're everywhere. But they're not actually adapting to how each student learns, so everyone quickly realizes that they're not actually thinking, at least not yet. So the question shifts. What if the computer could actually understand how you think. So in 1988, Dr. John Anderson, a professor at Carnegie Mellon, challenges his friend Stephen Ritter to show that machines could be used to help teach humans on the individual level to create personalized digital tutors. So Ritter takes decades of cognitive science research and builds Carnegie Learning, the first AI tutor based on how humans actually think. This isn't your grandma's rule-based AI, a program that simply checks if your answers are right or wrong. Instead, Carnegie Learning creates individual cognitive models for each student. It analyzes thinking patterns, identifies exactly where understanding breaks down, and adapts in real time. So by 1998, they began testing it in real schools, and the Results? Students using Carnegie Learning show nearly double the growth on standardized tests. And so for the first time, an AI tutor matches the effectiveness of one-on-one -on -one human tutoring. But true AI experts knew that the success was anecdotal, just a few schools here and there proving the concept. And no one's collecting data at scale to truly grow the AI. But then 2002 changed everything because President Bush signs No Child Left Behind. And suddenly, every school in America must test students annually and publicly report scores by demographic subgroup. So overnight, schools become obsessed with data because now every school in every district in every state needs analytics tools, personalized interventions, and measurable outcomes. So the entire education system transforms into a data-driven machine. But in the middle of this chaos, a hedge fund analyst named Sal Khan gets a phone call. His 12-year-old cousin Nadia is struggling with math. Khan starts tutoring her over Yahoo Doodle. So word spreads through the family, and within weeks he's tutoring 15 cousins and instantly gets overwhelmed by the demand. So he starts recording videos and posting them on YouTube. So by 2008, millions are watching. Even Bill Gates admits he uses Khan Academy with his own kids. Sal Khan has created a new phenomenon, but the idea of a future where every person on the planet gets their own virtual tutor isn't lost on Khan. So he quits his lucrative hedge fund job to make free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. But Khan Academy proves something crucial, that building a data repository of millions of personal tutor roadmaps is the perfect training data to power the future of education. But there's still one problem. Not everyone in the world had the access to the internet and cheap devices to take advantage. So Khan begins to preach the importance of giving children around the world 
a way to have access to an education. So by 2010, the first piece falls into place when Google releases something to answer that exact call, Chromebooks. $200 laptops that run everything in the cloud. Because these devices are so cheap and easy to manage, schools can finally achieve one-to-one -one computing. Every student gets a device. But Chromebooks aren't just solving the hardware problem. They're secretly creating something else, massive educational data sets. Because when millions of students use Google Classroom, every click, every answer, every pause gets recorded, turning all of the data into the training fuel for AI education systems worldwide. So inspired by the newfound global access to the internet created by Chromebooks and the smartphone, a Guatemalan American computer scientist named Luis Von An decided to launch Duolingo in 2011, a platform to help people learn new languages easily. But it's not just a language app, it's an AI Trojan horse. Because every exercise completed by 500 million users trains Duolingo's algorithms to understand how humans actually learn languages, providing endless insight to AI researchers around the world on how to use digital data and learning to teach students. So in 2012, two Stanford professors, Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig, learned about the power of Duolingo's strategy. So they decided to put their AI course online. And within weeks, over 160,000 students enrolled. So they build an AI to grade everything, quizzes, homework, even essays. One class teaching the entire world automatically. So finally, all of the pieces needed to use AI to transform education are converging. Because now, they're affordable devices for everyone. Massive educational data sets and easy to deploy cloud infrastructure at scale. So the world now has AI that can grade and adapt. But unfortunately for students and educators alike, these systems still have one huge flaw. They can't truly understand natural language. They can't have a conversation. They can't explain why you're wrong. But in 2017, all of that was about to change when Google launched the Transformer architecture. No, not those Transformers. I'm talking about the AI architecture, which is nothing more than a really smart robot that can read and understand text really fast. So companies like OpenAI and Google begin experimenting with a generative chatbot using Transformers that are pre-trained on millions of layers of text, allowing humans to interact with a dynamic generative AI for the first time. But then, in March of 2020, right before both companies could release their prototype to the world, COVID-19 happened. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. And overnight, 1.6 billion students go online. And all of a sudden, every lesson is on Zoom. Every assignment is digital and accidentally creating the largest digital educational experiment in human history. So because of COVID, teachers who resisted technology for decades become power users overnight and students are instantly comfortable with AI powered tools. So now educational data sets are exploding at an unprecedented rate, immediately supercharging OpenAI's and Google's generative pre-trained transformers and naturally creating the perfect storm for what happens next. Because on November 30th, 2022, OpenAI releases ChatGPT. And within five days, they reach one million users. Within weeks, students are using it to write essays, solve calculus, and explain quantum physics. Academic performance jumps from 40th to 80th percentile. Because now, every student suddenly has a personal tutor that never sleeps, never judges, and never runs out of patience. But educators are freaking out because the same power that enables learning enables cheating. 89% of students admit using ChatGPT for homework. School districts ban it and call emergency board meetings. And overnight, ChatGPT causes a global academic integrity crisis. So the education system faces an impossible choice. Ban AI and fall further behind or embrace it and redefine what learning means. But some educators quickly realized that banning ChatGPT proves impossible. So some forward-thinking educators decided to integrate it instead. Khan Academy launches Conmigo with GPT-4, and Harvard studies show AI tutors teaching physics twice as effectively as traditional methods. But students get creative. Smart glasses from Meta and Google launch, and they allow students to photograph tests and display answers invisibly, right in their eyes, unbeknownst to educators. TikTok explodes with tutorials to students on how to beat AI detectors. So now, the cheating arms race officially 
escalates. So universities panic. Blue Book exam sales spike 80% because they want to move back to handwritten tests. Honor codes rewritten. Some believe this is the end of education as we know it. But in reality, this is the same pattern that's played out with every educational technology. Resistance, adaptation, transformation. Which brings us to today, where schools like Georgia State University use AI to track 800 risk factors for 40,000 students daily. The result? A 103% increase in African-American graduation rates, showing strong trends toward eliminating achievement gaps, giving credence to the idea that AI in education is actually a good thing. I, th I think this is an important aspect of teaching. We're not talking about removing the uh, teacher. Uh, in the teaching function at all, but we're giving her a leverage so that she can take user time more efficiently and then teach a larger number of students effectively. So let's say the quiet part out loud. AI doesn't replace teachers, it amplifies them. Why? Well, because every student gets personalized learning paths. Teachers become learning coaches, not information deliverers. And real-time analytics show exactly where each student struggles. But the fundamental question remains, what exactly does learning mean when AI can do your homework, take your tests, and even think for you? Which brings us back to the question Sherwin asked Bitzer in 1960. Why can't we use computers for education? Well, guess what? Now we can. So now, in some cases, AI tutors are outperforming human teachers. So the new question becomes, in a world where AI knows everything and can teach anything, what should humans learn? And how do we ensure students actually understand and not just provide the right answer? And it's all because the revolution that started with Plato's room-sized mainframe has led to AI tutors in everyone's pocket. And because of this transformation, education will never be the same. But the story is just beginning. If you want to know more about why educational technology keeps promising revolutions but delivering disappointments, check out Failure to Disrupt by Justin Reich. He spent years at MIT studying exactly why every new technology promises to transform education, but ends up reinforcing the same old patterns. Resistance, adaptation, change. It's a really good read. And if you're looking for more history on artificial intelligence, go watch this video on the entire history of artificial intelligence. It's a really good story. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.